Hello, and welcome to this webinar focusing on a new OECD report, Equations and Inequalities, Making Mathematics Accessible to All. Andreas Fleischer, Director of the OECD Directorate for Education and Skills, will present the findings of the report. Chiara Monticone and Mario Piacentini, both analysts in the Directorate, will join us to answer your questions after the presentation. Please feel free to send your questions to Eric Magnuson using the chat function at any time during the presentation. Andreas? Yeah, unfortunately, this, I can't share my screen still. There seems to be something wrong. Okay, it seems to be going now. Good, I hope you can see the presentation now. Welcome to the presentation of this report. It's a really interesting analysis from PISA. For the first time, it doesn't only look to what extent students do well in math or not so well, but actually the type of mathematics that they learn. And uh, the first thing that we know is that mathematics plays an increasing, increasingly important role at work. Basically, you look at the people, the share of people who use or calculate fractions or percentages, and that's at least a third in some countries, half. Using advanced mathematics or statistics also is not just a very small uh, minority. Simple algebra or formally, again, something that is relevant for at least a quarter or a third of the workforce. So when we talk about mathematics, we really talk about everybody's business. We also see that mathematics skills do have an impact. Our survey of adult skills showed that you know having a job is quite closely related to mathematics skills. Being in the top quarter of earnings, you know, your likelihood is one point more than 1.5 as high if you're doing well on math as opposed to if you just have foundation skills. Uh, so it is an increasingly important kind of skill. We also see across countries that uh, there is more time devoted to mathematics classes in many countries. Now, if, it's, if you look sort of the difference between 2003, when we had the last full mathematics assessment, and then 2012, where we had another one, uh, you can really see that uh, OECD countries, on average, spend 13 minutes more per student per week in a mathematics class. So there's more attention being paid on mathematics. So I want to talk a bit about the framework behind of the report. The learning outcomes obviously depend on the quality of instruction. Now, the quality of education can never exceed the quality of teaching. But it also depends on the opportunity that individual students get to learn. And that's basically what we can directly shape through teachers, school systems, and so on. And then there are individual attributes, you know, students' ability, their perseverance, their aptitude. Those are basically student characteristics that we need to take into account. So this report is really about that corner of the equation, the opportunities that students have to be exposed to different forms of mathematics. Opportunity and also time investment that is involved. Now, how access to mathematics matter, matters and how it can be measured. Let's talk a bit about the relationship that we see between different forms of mathematics. And if mathematics would just be mathematics, you wouldn't see a scatter cloud here because on a horizontal axis, I, would, I show you the exposure of students to pure mathematics. It's basically the focus on deep conceptual understanding. Basically, students getting exposed to concepts in mathematics so the fundamental principles, the extent to which they can think like a mathematician. On the vertical axis, I show you the exposure to applied mathematics. That's where students are asked to use mathematical concepts in an application in a real world setting. And each of the dots here is on country. And you can see actually they are all over the place. You take the example of Sweden, for example. Students in, at age 15, don't see much of you know conceptual conceptual focus, pure exposure to pure mathematics. There's actually also not that much exposure 
<coughs> well, actually, no, there is more than average exposure to applied mathematics. So Sweden is a country, you know, where students are often confronted with very practical problems, but not so much to sort of the under sort of pinning principles of mathematics. You take a country like Portugal that's not doing well on either side of the spectrum. You take a country like Korea that is due on both dimensions. Both conceptual understanding and applied mathematics feature quite strongly in Korea. And then you take a country like Italy where there is a focus on sort of formal pure mathematics with less emphasis on conceptual understanding. So you can actually see how the patterns of exposure vary quite a bit across countries. And that tells us this has to do with the design of our instructional system, quality and, and the nature in which mathematics is being defined, textbooks are done, and instructional systems operate. So this is something that public policy seems to be shaping quite differently in different countries. To give you an example, you know, there are large differences among countries in students' familiarity with algebra. We measured this on an index, you know, students who never heard the concepts, who heard the concept once, heard it twice, and so on. And you can basically look at this on this index, and you can see how this varies across countries. You take a country like Sweden that comes at the bottom, end. basically, when students were confronted with algebra problems, and most of them would say they'd never heard or hardly heard of that concept. When you go to the other end of the spectrum in Singapore or in Shanghai and so on in Japan, basically there are many students say, or the students say typically that they have often heard about uh, algebraic concepts. So this is an example how the exposure to certain mathematical concepts really varies enormously across countries. You can also see the same with geometry. You can see the same pattern uh, looking at exposure. And again, on the end of, of low exposure, you find a country like, like Sweden, where actually the majority of students have never heard or hardly heard of the concept. And then again, you can see at the top end of the spectrum, uh, Singapore or Shanghai, where students have often heard or knows the concept or say that they know the concept well. Familiar varies across countries. Now, what is very interesting is, for us it was very interesting, is that this exposure, the exposure, for example, to pure mathematics, and the reason why I'm going to focus on pure mathematics, deep conceptual understanding in mathematics, the capacity of students to think like a mathematician, the reason why I'm focusing on this so much is because that is one of the best predictors for actually strong overall outcomes. And what we can see is that it's not only mathematics performance that varies by, you know, social background. We've known that all along, you know, that children from wealthier backgrounds can do better in math and children from poorer backgrounds not so well. That's quite a sort of familiar phenomenon. But for the very first time, we're actually now also seeing that the exposure to that kind of conceptual understanding in mathematics is actually quite significantly related to social background. When you look at the students in the bottom quarter of the social economic spectrum, now that's basically the most disadvantaged students, you can see their index values are typically a lot lower than those who are in the second quarter, in the third quarter, or in the top quarter. In other words, you can see here that basically the type of mathematics that you learn actually varies by social background. And students from the disadvantaged backgrounds get typically much less frequently exposed to the type of mathematics that is actually very, very important to give you the fundamentals in mathematics. But there are exceptions. And I want to highlight just a couple of them. Look at the, uh, the results for Shanghai that I've highlighted here. Generally, exposure to pure mathematics is strong, and it's very, very similar to all socioeconomic backgrounds. You can see the same in Macau, China. So there you have basically students, whatever socioeconomic background you come from, you do get a strong focus on the kind of deep conceptual understanding in mathematics. Denmark would be another country with a similar picture, and it doesn't vary that much by social background, but you know, actually very few students in any part of the social spectrum get exposed to the kind of pure mathematics that matters so well. 
So actually, if you think about it, very few countries where you can say, well, students from all social backgrounds really benefit from the kind of teaching mathematics that is very, very important to help them grow. Huge variation in the, in, in the exposure to mathematics by social background. And in a way, we find that deeply troubling because it does tell us that in a, it's not just, you know, social background, family wealth, you know, driving outcomes because poorer children have less kind of opportunities, less resources at home and so on. But you can really see how the type of mathematics teaching varies. So the opportunities we give students almost uh, already discriminate by social background. You can also see that uh, socioeconomic uh, profile of students explains some of them. This is basically the variation in familiarity with mathematics that is explained by socioeconomic background at the level of individual students. And you can see it can be significant, but actually when you look at the social composition of schools in many countries, it's a much more powerful predictor. So once again, how schools aggregate socioeconomic context, basically segregating students by social background, that becomes a big driver of familiarity with mathematics. Let's have a look at a couple of countries. Now you can see the example of Spain or Portugal. There you can see it's the individual social background and the school social background that do make a difference. But if you focus, our, for example, on Japan or the Netherlands, there you can really see social background is largely impacting students collectively through the school. So it's not only that students are penalized by their individual social background, but they typically disadvantaged students, typically attend schools with other disadvantaged students, and it's that collective impact that basically drives exposure. In other words, in disadvantaged students, mathematics doesn't get taught in the kind of ways that you see in high-performing countries elsewhere. Very, very important results because they really show us that part of the problem of inequality and opportunity is really about the school system, is not about the home background. You can also look at this, you know, by uh, background characteristics. You can see, for example, girls or non-immigrants and students who attended pre-primary education tend to be more familiar with mathematics. That's probably not a surprise to you. Uh, but particularly large is the bar by pre-primary education. Um, <clears throat> so I think that is uh, quite an important concept here, that early learning really can create the foundations for students to be familiar at age 15 with those fundamental concepts. Now, I want to come back to the issue of, you know, what, why is it that in some countries the, the aggregate social background of schools is such a powerful determinant of learning outcomes? And part of this lies in the structure of school systems. On the horizontal axis, I show you the percentage of students in schools that engage in a given practice. Now, for example, in transferring lower TV students to another school, these are school systems where it's very easy for a school to say, well, we don't, we are basically sending non-performing students somewhere else. And uh, you can really see how the more unequal access is closely related to the prevalence of transferring students. You can also see that considering academic performance for admissions to be academically selective is again something that reinforces inequalities in access to the type of massive students. On the other hand, you know, where schools are a lot more focused on residents, you know, they're basically uh, <coughs> not uh, selecting academically or socially, you can see that that actually is declined. So basically, kind of policies that we use for selection and admission are part of the explanation why basically access is unequal and to the extent that those characteristics relate to social background, they explain to you why social aggregation can be a powerful determinant. Tracking as well, now basically you can see here the student's first age at where they are separated into different school uh, sizes is actually a quite powerful predictor for inequality in access. If you look at countries on the left side, you know, Austria, Germany, Slovak Republic, Turkey, Czech Republic, Hungary, there, you know, the access to mathematics, at least in the countries above the triangle, are quite 
high, and then on the other end of the spectrum where the selection takes place at a very late stage, uh, you see a whole number of countries bunched up there. There, basically, you can see that we have more equal access to mathematics at HSE. So tracking, streaming, all of those devices tend to be also related to inequality in access to mathematics. So what have we learned from this? Uh, in part, you know, access to mathematics varies by the individual student characteristics. Exposure to and familiar with mathematics increases with socioeconomic status. We've seen that clearly. And they vary by student's gender, back immigrant background, and also the attendance of pre-primary education. Schools can make a difference. Grade repetition, the way the students get admitted and selected, tracking are said to be associated with more unequal access to mathematics. And um, then at the, at the last but not least, teaching resources and practices. I didn't highlight this so much now, but disadvantaged students tend to have slightly lower student to teacher ratios. That looks good. But mathematics teachers in disadvantaged schools tend to be less qualified. You have to sort of uh, look at that really carefully. On the one hand, we are giving more teachers to disadvantaged schools, but we are giving the less qualified teachers to the disadvantaged schools. We've also seen, and there's an interesting chapter on this in the report, that the use of cognitive activation practices. That's basically, you know, having high expectations on students, making sure that they are present in the instructional context, that there's close interaction uh, that is associated with greater performance and also familiarity in socioeconomically advantaged schools. Let's now turn to exposure to mathematics in school and performance and the overall outcomes on the PISA assessment. Some really interesting data here. What well, the first thing we see is that class time is associated with improved improvement in mathematics performance. Now, we're basically, and you know, that's more or less what you would expect, where you have less than two hours uh, of mathematics per week, you tend to do less well than that when there is between two and four hours. And this could be just the time value. It could, could also be a selection decision. Now, students who are doing better in mathematics, choosing courses that give them more exposure. There are many factors going on. And you see a similar picture in reading, but only up to a point, and in science uh, also. So basically, volume of exposure is one thing that matters. We've seen before, it's the nature of instruction that matters, but volume does matter as well. And you can <coughs> also see that uh, exposure to pure mathematics is more strongly related to performance than exposure to applied math. Remember that was one of the very first points I made, you know, why is it important that students you know, have the kind of high quality math instruction that puts a premium on deep conceptual understanding. And you can see that really here when you look at applied mathematics and pure mathematics by the quintile of exposure you can really see that uh, pure mathematics, really, the more you get out of this, the more your overall results here on the vertical axis are rising, where that, whereas that is not so clear for just applied mathematics. And again, you know, the kind of higher order thinking skills that are involved in the, in the in, um, pure mathematics, they are obviously prevalent in the more advanced PISA. So overall, it's not so much a uh, surprise as you can see. Uh, what's interesting is that this uh, feature even remains after accounting for school characteristics. And this is here the relationship between exposure and performance among students in the same school. So basically, I've taken out all of the school characteristics, and you can see a huge difference, particularly in countries like Korea or Spain, Malaysia, uh, less so on the left side of the screen. So again, exposure to pure mathematics is really important even after taking into account the school that students actually attend. So what have we learned from this? Several things. The structure of the curriculum matters. Countries where students have higher familiarity with geometry and algebra perform better on all tasks and relatively better on tasks requiring geometry and algebra. So those are very important ingredients that are important. And performance on tasks is a focus on geometry deteriorated very slightly between 2003 and 2004. The amount, type of mathematics tasks and performance, instruction time matters. 
Beyond six hours, you don't see that clear relationship anymore, but up to that point, it's quite obviously, obviously visible. Exposure to pure mathematics tasks strongly relates to performance, and exposure to and familiar with mathematics concepts may not be sufficient for solving problems that require the ability to think and reason mathematics. Socioeconomic disadvantage and exposure. We've seen that very clearly. Disadvantaged students lag behind other students, particularly in those complex tasks that do require advanced modeling skills and the use of symbolic language. Again, you know, the fundamental building blocks of mathematics. That was about performance. We've also an interesting chapter on attitudes towards mathematics. I'm going to just show you a very few slides on this, but the chapter really is worth reading. The first thing is that we see that less than half of the students enjoying studying mathematics. You can see that here, it varies by countries, uh, but basically part, you know, from Indonesia, Thailand, uh, and, and so on. You can really see that uh, mathematics isn't a popular topic among students. Very little difference between 2003 and 2012 overall. It varies across countries, but that's an obvious uh, <coughs> uh, factor. Interestingly, students who have friends that are hardworking tend to be more motivated to learn. And that's especially true in schools where students are least familiar with mathematics. Interesting. So if you're in a school you know, where mathematics doesn't play that role, having friends who are really working hard at school actually seems to make you more motivated. What you can see here is the change in the likelihood that students who agree with the statement at the bottom of the chart actually <coughs> uh, uh, associated with having friends who work hard on mathematics. So basically, you have a friend who is hard working in mathematics that makes you 1.5 times as likely to be interested in the things you learn in mathematics in a school where students tend to be familiar with math and over twice as likely in a school where students are less familiar with mathematics. So again, you know, the peers around you are an important factor influencing your own motivation, particularly in a context where mathematics isn't that sort of common in the school context. We also see that high-performing students whose parents do not like mathematics uh, are more likely to feel helpless. It's very interesting as well. You know, it's not just peers. You can see very clearly among parents. I show you in gray the bottom quarter of mathematics performance and in, 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 in blue the top quarter of students in mathematics. These are the high-performing students. And what you can see here is, for example, in the case of France, the high-performing students are over almost two and a half times as likely uh, to feel helpless if their parents don't like mathematics than uh, <clears throat> the other group of students. So this is such an important question. You know, the attitudes that your parents have are influencing the way in which our students relate to those school subjects. Teachers' feedback. I'm moving from students to teach, uh, parents, teachers. Teachers' feedback practices have a quite different relationship with students' anxiety towards mathematics, depending on student familiar with mathematics. If you have, if you are a low familiarity student, you know you have to, are not familiar with mathematics, then actually getting feedback from teachers tends to be actually raising raising anxiety. If you are a student with a high degree of familiarity. Getting feedback from students, from teachers, tends to lower levels of anxiety. It's really interesting how those two factors, familiarity and feedback from teachers, seem to be interacting in different contexts. Using a computer during mathematics lessons is associated with higher motivation for learning mathematics. As you may remember from our report on computers and instruction overall, we didn't find that much of a positive relationship between student exposure to digital technologies and performance, but at the same time, when you look at motivation, that seems to be something that using computers is enhancing. Here you can see the change in intrinsic, intrinsic motivation for mathematics associated with using a computer, and you can see even after accounting for students in school characteristics, that is quite strong. So what are the key messages here? 
the opportunity to learn and the attitudes towards mathematics, having being exposed to more complex math is associated with lower self-concept and higher anxiety. Actually, I didn't show you that chart, but it's one of the outcomes, and higher self-concept and lower anxiety among high-performing students. When you think about mediating factors, peers, hard-working friends that can increase mathematics self-concept, but students can also develop lower beliefs in their own ability when they compare themselves to higher achieving peers. Parents can transfer their feelings about math to their children, even and particularly high-performing ones. And teacher practices can have a very different relationship with student self-concept and anxiety depending on the student's familiarity with mathematics. Now remember, students who are familiar with, uh, uh, with mathematics tend to benefit from teacher feedback. Students who are not familiar with mathematics, their teacher feedback seem to, seems to raise anxiety. So, what does all of this mean for policy? A couple of conclusions. The first conclusion we draw is that we need to develop coherent standards, frameworks, and instruction material for all students, covering the core ideas of mathematics in more depth. What we have seen is actually the three things that really matter for a good instructional system. It's rigor, it's focus, and it's coherence. Most systems doing well teach few things well in great depth so that students get familiar with the fundamental building blocks of mathematics. They teach the focus on a few things, uh, cognitively demanding, the concept of cognitive activation is very important, and they basically have a coherent instructional system. We've highlighted Singapore in the report where the mathematics curriculum covers a relatively small number of topics in great depth, and it's actually quite typical in Asia. They're following a kind of spiral organization in which the topics are introduced early on and then covered in more detail and in a more sophisticated ways in later grades. Second lesson. Helping students acquire mathematical skills beyond content knowledge. Routine tasks need to be replaced with challenging open problems that are about, this is about cognitive activation. In, in many contexts, basically, having just simple applied problems doesn't seem to be conducive to better outcomes. That means, you know, helping teachers to develop those skills, integrating problem solving into the abilities assessed. And that's actually something that we're seeing in a fair number of countries. The recent revisions of the mathematics curriculum in England, Scotland, Korea, and Singapore have all increased the emphasis on problem solving skills. The issue of how the school system is organized is always important. As you could see, tracking and streaming have a quite negative impact on exposure to mathematics and segregating students. You can either you know, delay that tracking or mediate its effect. Sweden and Finland were countries that reformed their education systems already in the 1950s to 70s, basically creating a more comprehensive approach to schooling. Also, Germany and Poland are working on reducing tracking and its impact, so they're a good example. Dealing with diversity, providing students with multiple opportunities to learn key concepts, different levels of difficulties, offer student-oriented practices, more individualized support for struggling students is very important. Finland is a good example here. Half of the children with special education needs are mainstreamed and assigned special teachers. Finland also devotes 30% of instruction time outside formal classrooms, so plenty of opportunity to engage the students. Supporting positive attitudes towards mathematics, very important. Technology can be part of the solution, as you could see in the report. Uh, learn how to give effective feedback to struggling students and the parent equation. Uh, the 2011 revisions of the math curriculum in Korea has reduced curriculum content to give more time to engaging activities. Very important, creating more space for depth of learning, uh, removing some of the overload of content. And last but not least, monitoring and analyzing opportunity to learn. We just know very little. We are at the very beginning of understanding how the exposure to mathematics learning really varies across countries. You can collect and analyze data on the implemented curriculum, both from teachers and from students. And uh, that's certainly one of the topics that will remain with us also for the PISA assessment.
the latest versions of the PISA assessment actually allow us not only to look at the degree of correctness of the PISA task, but also in much greater detail on how students got to those tasks. Now, the digital assessments actually track very carefully the solution strategies that students apply. So we should be able to do much more fine-grained analysis around those kinds of topics in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andreas. Um, we have some questions for you, and perhaps also for Chiara and Mario, who are who are here to join us in answering questions. Um, this is, I don't know, perhaps two separate questions or two related questions. Why is it that pure mathematics is so much more related to good performance, uh, to higher performance than applied mathematics? And uh, a corollary question. Isn't it true that there are, there is a move towards using more applied mathematics problems in school uh, with the thinking behind it that students prefer to work on problems that they can relate to? Yeah, obviously, you know, we need to make mathematics relevant. I think that is very, very important. But that's not what we are talking about here. When we talk about pure mathematics, it's really about having an instructional context where students learn about the foundations of a discipline. You know, learning to think like an historian, like learning to think like a mathematician, learning to think like a scientist. And our analysis is when students have really understood the foundations of a discipline, they can extrapolate from this. They can apply that knowledge in novel contexts and use the mathematics and do well when they get very sophisticated problems. However, if we teach students you know, only tips and tricks, how to solve everyday, small everyday problems, they know how to solve those everyday problems, but they're not good in transferring their knowledge to novel context. And this is often what, I, what they're asked to do in real life and what they're asked to do in the PISA test. The PISA test confronts students often with problems they have not seen in school. And the test of truth there is, you know, have I got a sufficiently deep understanding of the discipline? And that's how we explain that it's this pure mathematics, the deep conceptual understanding, uh, where that is fostered, that students do really well. I give you an example that was very instructive for us. In 2009, in the middle of the financial crisis, the OECD embedded an assessment of financial literacy in the PISA task, you know, basically to know how well students can cope with financial tasks. And the assumption was, you know, where countries had more financial education, you know, they would do better on this test. But in fact, interestingly, we found we didn't find any relationship between the exposure to financial education, the application, you know, in a financial context, and financial literacy. The students who did best on the assessment of financial literacy were the students in Shanghai, in China, who had never heard about those concepts. How could they solve those financial tasks? Well, because they knew the underlying concepts. They knew what risks are, what probabilities are likelihood. They could make uh, uh, inferences. They could use mo mathematical modeling, mathematical reasoning. And so they were actually, for them, it was actually quite easy to solve problems in novel context. Whereas the students that had been taught in, on, in financial education, once they were exposed to problems looking slightly different, they found really difficult. Now, all of that should not mean that we shouldn't make mathematics relevant and that mathematics should be contextualized. and. Um, I think that's a, that, that obviously is a very, very important part, but um, the, the two things can go very well together. Another question, uh, actually another two questions, um, that maybe uh, Mario or uh, Chiara could reply to is, how is exposure to pure mathematics measured? Um, uh, the questioner asks uh, because he or she is confused about uh, pure versus applied mathematics since PISA is famous for having more concrete applied type of, pro of problems in its assessment. I, I think I can, I can take this one. Um, yes, the, the measurement of the pure and applied mathematics is done through the student questionnaire. Basically, the students are, ask, are asked for pure mathematics, how often they are exposed to tasks involving, for example, linear or quadratic equations. While for applied mathematics, always in the questionnaire, students are asked how often they do applied problems, like, like for example, 
from using using a, a timetable and deriving how much it takes to get from one place to 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 another. So, what what is interesting in 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 the analysis is that we have, we were able to like uh, relate this question on exposure to different types of mathematic tasks to performance in PISA and as the the survey said, PISA is essentially about the capacity of applying mathematics to to real life, so to use mathematics for solving real problems. And what, what, what we observe is that, is that like acquiring a deep conceptual understanding, so acquire, uh, uh, like exposure to pure mathematics and to the knowledge of concept is more strongly related to the capacity of students to apply mathematics in real life context. So this is partly like it's, it's what, what Andreas was saying is that a good conceptual level of conceptual understanding is the building block on which students can can really build in order to acquire capabilities to to go and use mathematics in real life then the other the other the other the other um, the other thing is that is that uh, in the, in our measurement of applied mathematics we we ask students about relatively simple applied mathematics tasks so in, in some sense, students who are exposed to this type of mathematic task, very simple mathematic task, in some cases are relatively low performing students that need some kind of contextualization and like uh, or, uh, simplification of the problems in order to access more complex content. So our main conclusion is that, that it's not very much the contextualization, as Andres said, it's not really the problem. The problem is that even when contextualized problems and applied mathematics problems are used, these problems should still relate to the conceptual foundations, the big ideas of mathematics, in order to build that level of conceptual understanding the student needs in order to apply mathematics in real life. Thank you, Mario. Um, another question we have um, is concerns Spain. Um, the person we saw on, the, on one of the slides, the 15-year-old students, seem to have 43% are more 43% more likely to be anxious towards mathematics if their parents hate mathematics problems. Um, could you could someone there explain why this is true? I think the relationship is not just there for Spain. It is actually across countries that uh, the attitude of parents seems to be influencing the way in which students confront mathematics. You know. Uh, there will be different hypotheses. One hypothesis is if your parents don't like mathematics, you feel that you know mathematics isn't something that you can master. That the, the, your degree of self-efficacy might be lower, and you might think, well, you know, if I am put in a demanding context, I won't succeed. I get more anxious with this. Whereas if your parents, you know, are very, very sort of positive if, about mathematics, sort of instill in you the idea that your success depends on your effort and the way you engage yourself, as opposed to, you know what you like and not like, uh, maybe you feel more ownership for actually finding solutions and being less afraid. How that relationship operates uh, is not, uh, cannot be discerned from this data, but the fact that this is there and quite consistently there across countries shows that actually parents can do a lot to help their children succeed in mathematics. Even with their attitudes, you know, this is not about spending three hours of homework with your students. This is simply, you know, giving you that your student, your children, a sense that actually this is something that is important that uh, you like, that you think is important, and that they can relate to. Thank you. Uh, another participant asks uh, if if you could indicate any resources that could be used for appropriate teacher training. Um, could experiential learning provide any opportunities to enhance students' motivation and self-efficacy in solving mathematical problems? Yeah, you know, this is about pedagogy. It's also about standards and curricula and instruction systems and textbooks. Now, we can actually see that the way in which mathematics taught is taught varies hugely across countries. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, yeah, it has to do with, with obviously, resources that are available for teachers. And I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a good sort of reference for that, but I think we should also look at the instructional system as a whole, you know, to what extent do different forms of mathematics uh, get articulated in national standards and expectations being specified. And I mean, this is a very, very important part of, of, of the answer. You can see basically 
I mean, uh, North America is a good example where we have typically instructional systems that are a mile wide, but only an inch deep. You know, the level of depths, the, the students get exposed to a lot of stuff, but actually in very limited depths. The counter example would be, you know, a country like Japan or Korea, where actually it's just one textbook and that's actually quite thin because it deals with very, a very limited range of material while leaving teachers a lot of room to teach and student understanding of those concepts. I think it's, there, there is a question, you know, what, are, what, what teachers can do, how teachers can train, but I think there's also the question of how we design the instructional system. Bye. If I can add just a few few words on that, uh, actually there exists there is more and more material that is available to teach, particularly in the area of of problem solving. Because we we show we show in the report that yeah that familiarity with mathematics and uh, and exposure of students to to tasks that require mathematics or so procedural knowledge is very important for performance, but might not be enough for solving the most complex. Pizza problems that require modeling capabilities, so the capabilities of translate a, a real-world situation to a mathematical model, and vice versa. So we, this, there are more and more like uh, many teachers wonder if they can really teach problem solving because it's it's complicated for them and also for the students. And uh, one 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 solution to this dilemma is that the fact that teacher can share knowledge, there are more and more resources like well-developed task problems that are online, uh, there are platforms in which teacher shares like not just not just the task but also but also like recommendation on how to implement the task. And one one important finding that is also in the in the general literature is that is that even in disadvantaged schools, disadvantaged contexts, problem solving, so this, this capacity of going much more in depth and asking students to reflect on problems, to find their own solution to problems, it's something that can be applied even in disadvantaged schools. If teachers have the good degree of preparation, if they can manage the classroom environment well, and if they have access to the right task, so, so problems and tasks that are engaging enough that relate well to the life of the students, and so that Thank you, Mario. Um, another question here. Could one of you give us an example of a contextualized problem that does not give students a deep understanding and one that does? Mario, you want to make a start? I, I think we might have lost Mario somewhere. I mean, then I, then I will just give you an example, you know, uh, looking up a number in a telephone book, you know, in a large book, there's a lot of kind of, uh, you can have a heavy context of, uh, problem that is quite demanding on students, so very laborious, but not really relating to underlying mathematical concepts. Uh, at the very same time, you know, we had an interesting uh, problem in the PISA assessment, there was a revolving door, the students had to get through. And then uh, the, the question was, you know, what, what should the angles of that door be in order that there is no air passing? And there you basically had to quite had to have a quite good understanding of, of the concept of space and geometry. And uh, that's an example of a problem that is applied, it's real, but at the very same time was going to the heart of mathematics. Another question that came in, what, if anything, can be done in primary education to, to begin to reduce these kinds of uh, inequalities and opportunities to learn? Yeah, I think uh, we, we do not actually know from the survey to what extent uh, the disparities, where the disparities arise. It may, may well be that they already arise in primary education. What, what does seem to be the case is that students from more disadvantaged backgrounds tend systematically to get be exposed to less demanding mathematics. Uh, it may be because you know they attend schools where the teachers are not as capable, where, where the resources are more limited. It may be because teachers themselves say, well, you know, children from disadvantaged background might learn mathematics easier in those kinds of more applied ways. You do not know the answer, but clearly the paths to disparities arise early in students' careers, and it is very, very important. We, we see an example of Shanghai. 
or the, or, or your Singapore, where you can actually succeed. You can actually ensure that students from all social backgrounds have a very similar level of exposure to the type of mathematics wherever they go to school. Andreas, you touched on this subject uh, earlier, but um, we'd like to get a, a bit more information about to what extent um, is the exposure to pure mathematics related to early tracking? What, what is that relationship? Well, the relationship is very clear that the earlier tracking happens, the larger the disparities between the group of students that get exposed to pure mathematics and the group of students that get exposed to applied mathematics. Uh, some of this might be that vocational education tends to be more focused you know, on, on tips and tricks in mathematics and academic education more on the kind of disciplinary uh, focus. So uh, there might, be, might, might, might well be plausible explanations for this, but what is very clear is the earlier the tracking occurs, the larger disparities between those two student groups. Another question from one of our participants, how do you envision integrating new technologies with mathematics teaching in particular? It's not an easy task. In fact, you know, our, our study, computers in schools basically suggested that there are more schools that get it wrong than schools that get it right, and more systems that get it wrong than systems get it right. Um, and that's not true for math, it's almost true for any subject. So. We are at the very beginning only. We have the technology, but we still lack the pedagogy that actually leverage the potential of technology. If we just use, you know, 21st century technology with 20th century teaching, we will actually distract, not add value to the teaching and learning process. So I think there's a lot of work to be done still to, uh, you know, give students meaningful mathematical experiences with which they can basically. Uh, <coughs> where computers can actually add to the learning process. The potential is huge. You know, imagine, you know, suddenly mathematics, when you think about mathematical modeling, you can't do that on a paper and pencil frame, but you can actually do that really well with a computer, visualizing complex mathematical functions. Again, you know, that's very hard to do in your mind on a piece of paper. It's very easy to do with a computer. The potential is huge, but I, 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 I think we're still quite far from making this happen. And, and what, if any, impact uh, do the results from this report have or should have on assessments in general? I think, you know, uh, our assessments should continue to strive to actually assess to what extent students master the foundations in mathematics. Less focus on, you know, the symptoms, you know, did students, you know, memorize a lot of content, but can they think like a mathematician? Do they know what mathematical modeling is? What the concept of space and shape look like? What probability is? And I mean, that's something our assessments have to go more to the heart of what good mathematics is, and less be less obsessed and less focused on the surface in which mathematics mathematics articulates itself. What we can see clearly from this data, where students are really really good at the former, they tend to also be able to extrapolate to whatever context they are confronted with. And, and what roles could teacher efficacy and school leadership play in math mathematics achievements for all students? Yeah, I think teacher efficacy is very, very important here. You know, uh, what you can see from this data is that you can't just, you know, teach mathematical. If you're not a very, very good expert yourself and really highly committed and believe that you can actually, you know, leverage that knowledge for your students, you'll probably end up more teaching just content as opposed to giving students that kind of deep understanding and passion for the discipline uh, that, you know, great teachers can, can, can convey. So I think this is a very, very Thank you very much. I think that's all we have time for today. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your interest in our report, Equations and Inequalities making mathematics accessible to all and in the OECD's work on education. This webinar has been recorded and will be available in a couple of days on our website www.oecd.org-edu. And thank you again for your time.